Thanks, Steph. Happy spring, everybody. I read that the official time of the vernal equinox was like one hour ago. So we have officially made it out of the bleak midwinter. Congratulations. You can tell it's spring because the college students are gone and so are the high schoolers. They are on the Ironman trip this week in California. So we encourage uh, each and every one of us to be praying for them, that God would meet them there and that they would have a great time away together. I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary. Pastor Tom is preaching in Erie this morning. I'm delighted to be with you to open God's word. It's something we do every week together. And one of the reasons why we do that is because we believe that the word of God is insightful for us about how we should live. We believe when we read it, we sense God speaking to us and clearly communicating to us how we might line our life up with the life that he has called us to. It's almost like we get feedback from the word of God whenever we open it and hear it. That's important for us because we want to be people who are self-aware. And we all know people who lack self-awareness. To be clear, it's not us. It's other people who lack it. I read that 95% of people think they are self-aware. And social scientists, I don't know how they can determine this, but they have determined that actually like 10% of people are actually self-aware. Lacking self-awareness is a problem. You don't see yourself as clearly as other people do. If we lack self-awareness, we are deceived about ourselves. We might come across as rude or arrogant and have no idea that that's how we come across to other people. People who lack self-awareness often think they are better at something than they actually are. Maybe you've heard the true story of Florence Foster Jenkins. There was a movie a couple of years ago that came out about her life that starred Meryl Streep and Hugh Grant. She was a socialite in the early 1900s who desperately lacked self-awareness. Florence loved to sing, but she couldn't. <laughs> that didn't stop her from giving voice recitals on a regular basis to her social circle in New York City, none of whom had the heart to tell her that she was maybe the worst singer in the world. She couldn't carry a tune. She couldn't sing on key. She had no rhythm whatsoever. She was terrible. She's like these people you've seen on American Idol or America's Got Talent. You know who they are. They audition and you think, has no one ever given you any feedback? Her mother had left her a large inheritance, so she had plenty of money. And because these recitals she had given, in her mind, had gone so well, she booked a concert at Carnegie Hall and gave a sold-out performance in front of thousands of people. It would be kind to describe the concert as cringeworthy. Before this one, all of her recitals had been just really for her friends, who apparently had never given her any feedback, and her manager slash boyfriend had kept critics away. But he couldn't keep them away from this large of a show. The reviews were scathing all over the New York City papers. She never sang publicly again. It is one thing to be deceived about our singing ability. It's another thing entirely to be deceived about our spiritual life. To view ourselves one way and to have God view us another. 
James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this letter that we're studying together in part because he was worried about Christians who lacked self-awareness, who were deceived about their spiritual lives. So let's open our Bibles or journals together to James chapter 1. If you're new to the Bible, James is a New Testament letter, which is known for its clarity and call to action for Christians. You can find it after the book of Hebrews and right before the book of 1 Peter. We're several weeks into our series. It's a study that we call a market up study. And we'll finish the first chapter of James today. In the second half of chapter one, James warns his audience three times about being deceived. Verse 16 of James 1 says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. James loved his fellow Jesus followers, and he didn't want them to lack spiritual self-awareness. He wanted them to see themselves clearly, to not be deceived. And one of the most common ways that we might be deceived about our spiritual life, we talked about last week when we looked at verse 22, which says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If we read the Bible and never do anything that it actually tells us to do, we're in danger of being that kind of person, one who is deceived, someone who lacks a kind of spiritual self-awareness. And the way to counteract that, according to James, is to be a doer of the Word of God. In the two verses we're going to look at today, verses 26 and 27 of James chapter 1, James is going to give us a few examples of how to do that, of how to be a doer of the Word. Verses 26 and 27 say, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. These three examples we're going to look at of how to be a doer of the word are not meant to be the exhaustive list. It's not like they're the only three ways of how to be doers of the word. They were probably top of mind for James when he wrote this letter. Perhaps they were issues in his day in the church that he was confronting. It's amazing how, how a letter that was written 2,000 years ago, though, could still be so practical and needed for us today. And these three themes that we're going to look at form sort of the key themes of the rest of this letter. There is a connection between self-awareness and being a doer of the word. Those who do the word refuse to be deceived about themselves. And James focuses on three areas, how to speak, how to serve, and how to stay unstained from the world. These three themes are what the rest of the book of James is really all about. It's it's as if these these verses today are the jumping off point for the rest of his letter. Speech is the key theme of chapter three. Serving others is what most of chapter two covers, and remaining unstained from the world is where James focuses his attention in chapter four. Before we look closely at these three examples, though, let's talk about one word that jumped out to me in the verses we're going to look at today. It's the word religious or religion. Three times James uses it in these verses. It might not be a word that we use very often, and this word is not actually used in the New Testament very often at all. This is one of the few places in the New Testament where this word, religion or religious, is used. 
probably because it's so general in what it describes. Religion can mean so many different things to so many different kinds of people. Because I'm a pastor, people use this word to describe me a lot. (laughs) Maybe they do about you too. And I don't know about you, but it it bothers me when people say, oh, this is my friend, John. He's very religious. (laughs) Like, what does that actually mean? That's the problem with this word is it's, it's so general. It can mean so many different things. And when someone describes you or me as religious, what are the people who are hearing that word thinking? Like religion can be a, a description of a person who just participates in a ceremony is meaningless to them. Religion can just simply describe tradition or rote memorization of things. It can mean so many different things. It really means the external display of your spiritual life. And the truth is, Jesus was not at all impressed with people who were really good at external religion. In fact, he railed against it in much much of his teaching. It was one of the things he preached against most often. And he did so to one group in particular, the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And if any group models for us this idea of external religion, it's the Pharisees. They were so concerned by appearing to be externally obedient, and yet on the inside, their their hearts were far from God. They plotted and succeeded at killing the Son of God, Jesus, all while maintaining an appearance of religion. On the outside, they were obedient, but on the inside, their hearts were were rebellious. And James says at the end of verse 26, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's like make-believe. It doesn't line up with what you're trying to portray on the outside. It's not true religion. It's fake. It doesn't matter how religious we think we are if we're deceiving our hearts. If we are inwardly rebellious, it doesn't matter at all how externally obedient we are. If we're only hearing the word and not doing what it says, then we are deceiving ourselves. And that kind of religion, which is just a facade, doesn't count for anything. So, the first example that James gives us of how to be a doer of the word is this, how we speak. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, this is all about speaking. Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, verse 34, you brood of vipers, How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Words matter. They can compliment or cut down. They can build up or blow up a relationship. And our words almost take the temperature of our hearts When the Bible uses the word heart, it means more than the way we probably think about it, which we think about the heart as like the center of our emotions, our feelings. But when the Bible uses the word heart, it means more than just emotions. It's the way we would think of our heart and our mind, our will, our desires. In many ways, Our whole person is wrapped up in the biblical idea of the heart. And so, as Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When we speak, 
we are revealing the truth about ourselves. James uses this vivid word picture when he talks about bridling the tongue. It's as if our speech is a wild animal that needs to be tamed. It has to be controlled. He'll go on in more detail about this extensively in chapter 3, but we all know that our words can betray us. We maybe get a little judgy. We might gossip or grumble. Perhaps we criticize someone behind their back in a way we never would to their face. Our words can be lies. They might be vulgar. They can be furious or abusive. And if we think we are religious, like in a self-righteous kind of way, and then just let our words loose like a Mustang, we probably lack a little spiritual self-awareness. The reality, though, is that religion alone can never tame the tongue. Only the Holy Spirit's work in us can reign in our hearts. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. The work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that can reign in our words. And that's what we need to be able to watch our words. So as we live as doers of the word of God, we want our speech to be a reflection of and an expression of our hearts for God. So how can we be more self-aware about our words? I think it takes a little work and a, and a bit of self-evaluation. I know for me that there are certain times where words might slip out that I would rather not. Recently I was skiing. I may have been going at a high rate of speed <laughs> and I caught an edge and crashed. And as I was crashing, I blurted out a word that I regret saying. <laughs> And then I said out loud, this was really dumb. Why, why am I skiing this fast? I was fine. Everything's fine. I have learned in my life that when I am afraid, I might say a curse word. Like I come to a sudden stop because the car in front of me stopped quickly and I'm afraid I'm going to crash into it. I'm afraid something terrible might be happening. I'm afraid I might get hurt. So I have to guard myself when I'm afraid because that might be a time when I might stumble. Lindsay was telling a friend of ours just this week about the first time she heard me swear when we were uh, first dating. We were having, I don't even remember this, but we were having dinner at my mom's house, my parents' house. I was washing the dishes afterward and I was cleaning a, a glass bowl of my mother's. And as I was cleaning it, I let it drop and it broke. And for some reason, Lindsay was telling our friend that this was the first time she heard me swear. I wasn't probably swearing because I felt badly about breaking the bowl, although I did. Probably I was afraid of how my mother was going to react. <laughs> like that's a trigger point for me. We all have trigger points in a variety of different ways. So it might be for some of us, we're around a group of friends who maybe are a little bit critical in their hearts. And we're triggered to be critical when we're around them. And we should be aware of that. Perhaps when we're with you know, friends from college, we step back into some old habits and we tell unsavory jokes. Perhaps when we're worried about how we might look to other people, we tend to lie. It's good to be aware of that. 
It's good to know that when we're with a group of people, we might be tempted to gossip or grumble so that we know when that might happen. It's also helpful for us to just have some verses in our hearts and minds that we might be able to go to when we know we're tempted to let our tongue loose. If it's bad language, you might go to Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. If we struggle with lying, also in Ephesians 4, verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. If it's gossip, Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Maybe it's grumbling or complaining. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Maybe it's being critical of others. Jesus said in the first verse of Matthew 7, judge not that you be judged. If there are certain places or certain emotions or certain things that happen in your life that trigger you, it might be helpful to print some of those verses out, carry them with you. If it's the car, you could put it on the dashboard. If you need to be reminded before you get ready to go to work, perhaps it's on the mirror. Maybe it's a screensaver on your laptop, whatever it is to help remind you of what God calls you to do, how to be a doer of the word in this way, and then ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I I struggle with this, with my tongue, and he can help you. You know, a great way of developing self-awareness is asking for feedback from other people. Could be a a spouse or a sibling, could be your small group. Say, hey guys, I'm just wondering, are there any ways that I could honor God more with my speech that you're aware of. And then listen. And then ask God to help. It matters how we speak. And how we serve. In verse 27, James says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. We're called to care for people, to live out our faith in love. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There is no question as we read the Bible that doers of the word serve the needs of people. That is a distinctly Christian idea. And it's throughout the scriptures, from the beginning to the end. It's always been the call of God's people. Right after the nation of Israel had been delivered by God from their slavery in Egypt, God gave his law to his people through Moses. And the law of God that came down at Mount Sinai was about all sorts of different things. There were laws about worship, laws about personal morality, and laws that would govern this new nation, the nation of Israel. And God made it a legal requirement in this nation to care for those who were in need. In Exodus 22, verses 21 and 22, God said to the people of Israel, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. For you were sojourners In the land of Egypt, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. It probably goes without saying, but orphans and widows in the first century in the ancient world had nothing. There were no social programs, next to no opportunities for women to earn money. 
And so they were a category of people who were especially helpless. And they are throughout the Bible meant to illustrate to us all kinds of people who are helpless and in need and to reinforce for us that we are called to help all categories of people who are helpless. Now, let's be clear. Just because this is a broad categorization throughout the scriptures, we absolutely are called specifically to care for the needs of widows and orphans. And I'm so thankful for so many of you who care for widows and orphans in so many ways in your own personal life. For those of you who have been called to grow your family through adoption and to care for orphans in need. For those of you who love foster kids and care for them and love them because you are living out this call of God directly in your life. That is one of the ways that we are called to be doers of the word, to care for literal widows and orphans in their affliction. Some of you, and you know who you are, are caring for some particular foster kids in a very specific way and for a family that is in a desperate situation. And I want to say thank you to you. The stories that I hear from you and from people who share them with me about the ways that you care for orphans and widows are such a blessing. Like it is indicative of the people of God that they would do this. And when I see this lived out in your lives without anybody telling you you have to do this or without being required to do it, it just blesses my heart to watch you minister and to love people in this way. It's a reflection of the work that God has done in your hearts. And I, I'm grateful for it. I thought because of the deep needs that exist for our families and our folks here today who care for orphans specifically, I thought we just might pause, the sermon's not over, but just pray for their needs and for God to bless them. So let's just do that. Father, I am thankful for the many families at Calvary who have grown their families through adoption. For the families right now, God, who are caring for foster kids and who are called to do that. I pray, God, that you would give them strength and help. I thank you for the ways that the gospel is proclaimed by caring for orphans. And I thank you, God, for these families who I admire and love for the ways that you have called them, the ways that you've provided for them, the ways that you have allowed them to minister in this way. I pray, God, you would bless them, help their marriages, help their families, provide for them in many ways, God, and do so for your glory and for their good. In the name of Jesus, amen. We have teams of men here at Calvary who serve widows through our Men of Action ministry. Hundreds of families at Calvary sponsor kids through compassion or world vision. We're called to, according to that verse in Exodus, to care for sojourners. Another way to describe that, or another word, is refugees. We have three teams at Calvary right now who are coming alongside three Afghan families to help them acclimate to our community. We're going to hear an update from our Boulder campus team next Sunday about the great things that God's doing in that ministry. Some of you serve at the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. Some of you serve at the Safe House. Some of you are mentors for kids at local schools that are deeply impacted by poverty, and they need people to come alongside them and help them. There are so many ways that you can help people in need, and we have a number of opportunities for you. If you sense God stirring your heart right now to maybe take a step and care for people who are deeply in need in our community, there's a card in the Calvary Cafe at the Welcome Center that you can pick up that details some of the ministries that you might pray about being involved in. And then you can let us know that you'd like to step in, or you can let us know on that Blue Connect card that's in front of you that you'd like to help care 
for the needs of people in our community. It is the heart of God to do this, to care for those in need. It is who God is. Psalm 68 verse 5 says that God is the father of the fatherless and the protector of the widows. That's who God is in his holy habitation. And the Bible is filled from front to back with our call to care for those in need. Do you notice that James says we're called to visit orphans and widows in their affliction? Like that's deep need. That takes us out of our comfort zone. It's not just when it's convenient or easy for us, but it's when those needs arise that we're called to step in and care for them. They're the ones who need our help the most. It's one way to be a doer of the word. So we've seen James give us examples of how to speak, of how to serve, And next, he's going to talk about how we can remain or stay unstained from the world. At the end of verse 27, it says, to keep oneself unstained from the world. That's religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father. To keep oneself unstained from the world. The world, in the language of the Bible, is like the way things work without God. If you just say, I'm going to live my life without thinking about God at all, just step into my personal desires, whatever my heart says to do, whatever other people are doing, that's the world. When people live without thinking about looking to or loving God. And we all know how easy it is to go along with what's happening in the world, to find ourselves being tempted by the way things work without God. The world has different definitions of success, different definitions of pleasure, different definitions of power than the Bible does. And the influence of the world can sort of contaminate us or stain us, to use the words of James. The world can make us dirty like a like a spot on a shirt that needs to be cleaned. Now let's remember, James will remind us in chapter three, we all stumble in many ways. We don't live perfect lives. We will live out throughout our life a constant tension between the world and its enticements and the will of God. The apostle Paul did. He talks about this when he says, I do what I don't want to do. I find that when I want to do right, then evil lies close at hand. That's the reality of our life. But God is gracious. And he calls us back to him. He forgives us and he sets us back on the right path. I think a key idea for us about keeping ourselves unstained from the world is found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I think that's the idea here. That love, our highest affection, is meant to be directed towards God. But if our highest affections are for the things of the world, for the worldly definition of success, for the worldly definition of power, for the worldly definition of pleasure, if those stir our hearts more than our love for God, then we have to be careful. Do we love the world more than the will of God? If we do, then we're deceiving ourselves about our spiritual state. Now the truth is we are unable to keep ourselves unstained from the world on our own. Religion won't do it. The only way to be unstained from the world 
is by the precious blood of Christ, who is like a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus is the one, the only one who can remove our sinful stains. His perfect, sinless, spotless life and the way he gave his life for us is what ultimately keeps us from being unstained from the world. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you asked him to forgive you? Have you confessed your sins to him? Have you turned over all of your spots and wrinkles, all of the stains of living life without him, and asked him to take it all away? He is the only one who can. There is no religion. There is no life of obedience that can save you. No other name who can forgive you. No other life that can be given for you. Only Jesus. If you have never asked him to save you, you can ask him right now, in this moment, right here, and he will. The worst kind of self-deception is a religious kind. Like if I think I live a good life, I'm a good person, I maybe even go to church occasionally, or I read the Bible, or I volunteer, or I'm better than these other people that I know, that is a kind of religious self-deception. Jesus says these terrifying words when he says, there will be some who will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you. That's a warning for us to be clear about where we stand before God the Father. And God is so clear to us about the way that we can find salvation, which is found in his son Jesus alone. So have you ever confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord? Have you said that to God? Jesus, I believe you are the Lord. Have you said that? Have you believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you have, God promises you will be saved. And if you haven't yet, I would invite you to do it today. After you make that decision, the result of that is what James describes as a spiritual life that is pure and undefiled before God the Father because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The ones who are pure in heart have asked Jesus to cleanse their heart and have been forgiven of all unrighteousness. So we've talked about how we speak, how we serve, how we say, stay unstained from the world. These are three ways to be doers of the word and not to be deceived. These three themes in James are more than just a call to action for us, more than just a few of the ways we can be Christians. I think they're actually the overflow of the character of God. Quickly jump back with me to verse 18 of chapter one. We looked at this a few weeks ago. 
It says, of his own will, God brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his character. I want you to see how these themes of speaking and serving and staying unstained from the world overflow out of the character of God. First, God brought us forth by the word of truth. God speaks to us. We are born again by the power of the word of God. God speaks, and when he speaks, his words are true. They are never vulgar, never abusive. They build up, they comfort. And we carry with us in our speech the very message of salvation that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a gift that God would allow us to speak his words to others. And we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God has set us apart for his purposes. Be holy, for I am holy, God says. Live as I live. We are the only creatures that are made in the image of God. And we are meant to be unstained from the world, just like he is. That's who he is. And because we are his children, we should be like him, live like him, and love like him. We are the first fruits of his creatures, meant to be unstained from the world like he is. And God did all of this of his own will. This was all his idea. Just like we are called to serve people who are in need, God spontaneously, of his own will, cared for people who are helpless. People like me. People like you. Out of his own will, he did this. God helps the spiritually helpless. Those who are without hope in the world outside of God, God steps in and help us, helps us because of who he is. It was his idea to save a people from their sins. Out of his own will, he sent his only son into the world. No one forced him or coerced him. He did it of his own will because of his unimaginable love. This is the heart of God, to serve. The Lord Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for those who couldn't save themselves. God helps the helpless by speaking to us, by serving us. And it's all because of his glorious holiness. Who is like our God? Let's give thanks to him. Our Father, we are overjoyed by who you are and what you have done by offering to save us through the precious blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for any heart in this room today, God, who you might be drawing near to your Son. I pray you would speak the truth about who he is to their heart and soul. Call them to give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you, God, for your kindness, for your mercy, for your love for us. It's our joy to worship you, God, not only because of what you've done, but because of who you are, our glorious King, who we delight to serve. We bless you, God, for your great love for us. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, our Savior. Jesus. Amen.